Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm Dan Ferris. I'm the editor of Extreme Value and the Ferris Report, both published by Stansberry Research. And I'm Corey McLaughlin, editor of the Stansberry Daily Digest. Today we're going to talk with our colleague Dave Lashmit, editor of Stansberry Venture Technology. And our topic for Corey and I today will be something like... Fed make big mistake again. And remember, if you want to ask us a question or tell us what's on your mind, email us at feedback at investorhour.com. That and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. All right, amigo. (laughs) I'm just letting the listener know. Corey emailed me this morning. Yeah, Fed make big mistake. That That was the email that Corey sent me this morning. And I have to say, it's probably true because all right we we all know the situation right but let's just frame it quickly the economy appears to be in fairly good shape just by the headline numbers of you know growth and maybe even um inflation is indicating more economic activity um you know there there's basically you look at these numbers and then you hear the fed saying this week we promise we're going to cut rates soon, and it doesn't connect. Where it's it's a total disconnect. So you know if if you know inflation might be ticking up or or remaining somewhat volatile, let's just say, um, and if the economy is growing and unemployment is still near all time record lows or you know forty some odd year lows, not too far above them, why are they talking cuts? Right. You know. It, yeah. it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, I think it, it, it surprised me a couple of weeks ago when, and we, we we haven't talked about the Fed in depth in a while, um, but right. it surprised me a couple of <laughs> weeks ago when Jay Powell was testifying before Congress and, and literally promised that the Fed would be cutting rates later this year. Um, yeah. He said we can and will, and right? And so the market is definitely expecting it right? No matter what. Like, and they're believing it. And yep. which one that creates a problem for the Fed in and of itself, I think. Like if they even wanted to change policy, um, which they could, um, it would kind of, it would lead to some, uh, I think a lot of market volatility, I think. Um, right. Just with the, the rejiggering of those expectations. And yeah, I just, the longer this like volatile inflation goes on, which Oil prices are up twenty percent since December. Like that's not insignificant, um, right? <laughs> and they're just yeah. kind of pretending that everything's okay. Like that, like that doesn't matter. Um, yeah. Which it will matter eventually. I mean, to to a lot of people. And so it will. I I I just don't get it. And I'm not the only. Like I thought I was like alone and thinking this but then i heard other people talking no. about it after the, the fed oh, meeting yeah. this week and i was like yeah. okay i'm not i'm not <laughs> i'm not crazy here um you're not alone like it's all over yeah. sort of macro financial twitter bob elliott who we've had on the show former bridgewater guy um who founded a company called unlimited funds now his tweet i thought actually summed it up pretty well he says the majority of fed board members project that through the end of 2025 Growth remains above potential. Unemployment relain, remains at secular lows. Core PCE remains above mandate for the fifth year. And the Fed will cut 175 basis points or more. And then he says, one of these things is not like the others. And it's yeah, the cuts. Right. Right. <laughs> because yeah. you don't cut under those circumstances. It makes no sense. So, you know, then the next question uh, begged by all this is, are is the Fed telling us, we think this is, you know, these th- these other three things, you know, the growth and the unemployment and the core PC, uh, they're not going to be looking so hot by the end of 2025. Are they telling us that? I don't think they are. I, I don't think, think so he, either. I think they Powell just came would out. say it. Yeah, no, they, they one of the, um, this was one of those meetings where they do the, like, the quarterly projections and they, they bumped up the expectations for GDP for the year. So to yeah. over 2% from, it was, it was like in the ones when they did this three months ago. So, so no, they're projecting yeah. more growth. Um, same rate cuts, same amount of rate cuts, lower unemployment and lower inflation somehow. So I, you know, 
I don't, I, I don't, I don't know. So something, something's missing there. The only thing I can think of is that maybe, and they'll never say it, but the political angle of all of this and the uh, right, the of amount course. of debt that the amount of fiscal debt that the government has, and just the it's like a trillion dollars every a hundred days in interest payments right now, and. You know, Powell also said a couple months ago, like, it's time to have an adult conversation about the debt. So he's obviously thinking about it. Um, yep. So that's the only, that's where I come down. Like, that's the only thing that makes sense to me, that they seize a lot of, tr- like, possible trouble ahead with with that and the refinancing of corporate debt and and that whole thing. So Right, but thing, the, the political thing. angle, what, what you started out with, the, the political angle, th- that, to me, that's it. It's an election year. So they have to keep, you know, jawboning about cuts. We're gonna, don't worry. We're we're going to cut, Be- and the market has, of course, loves it, you know, uh, including gold, of course, right? There's a reason gold's making a new all time highs above two thousand um, dollars, right. and it's because, well, <laughs> it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to promise cuts under these circumstances, but it does make it if you view the Fed as being much more beholden to political interest and much less, you know, independent. Like everybody talks about their independence, which is baloney. Uh, I did a whole issue of the Farish report about this. Um, and I used the example of Arthur Burns in the 1970s. And I called the issue, the corruption of Arthur Burns, because there's all these telephone transcripts in which it just basically catalogs how heavily influenced by Richard Nixon he was. I would almost say controlled, you know, and he he did the same thing. He apparently, you know, we, you can't say it with certainty, but his actions indicated that he was interested in um, helping Nixon get reelected, basically, with monetary policy. And, I, you know, I'm not saying that uh, Powell wants Biden to get reelected. I'm not saying that. But he doesn't want the election to be. He doesn't want things to be chaotic. He doesn't want to get blamed for making things chaotic, right? So he's like, well, if we don't, don't worry. Don't worry. We're going to cut. Makes no sense. And he's going to, if he really, if they follow through on all this, if they're right about the projections through the end of 2025 and they follow through, you know, PCE will be ticking back up. We will be back, you know, CPI, all of it will tick back up. Oil. You know, probably natural gas will get off the bottom here and and gold will keep going, you know, 21 or 22, 2300, 25, whatever. 25 seemed like a distant dream, like not very long ago. I was like, oh, is it ever going to get up there? And now it's, Getting I would close, say spitting closer. distance, but it's a few yes. hundred bucks. Yeah. 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 So. I, I, yeah. I'm the political, there's one more note on the political angle of this. I mean, this, and this is the kind of thing that makes you think about, you know, you have Janet Yellen, a former Fed chair, as the Treasury Secretary currently. You have uh, Powell's former, then the Fed's like number two person, Lael Brainerd, is a senior economic advisor in, for the Biden administration right now. So, mm-hmm. you know, there's all they, they preach financial, they preach political independence, but there's so many conflicts <laughs> like that you yeah. can just easily point to. And then the second point. Like, what does this mean for the markets? It's probably not all that bad, you know, uh, generally speaking, because well, if in the short term, if if inflation right. picks up like and economic growth picks up and these, you know, these cuts do what they're that they usually do. Um, that's not a terrible thing for I don't think the direction of like the stock market in the short term. However, you get into this just the high inflation story again in a year or two and we're back and we're in that cycle that we've talked about a while ago, like hiking keep your incremental cuts in a, in a longer term hiking cycle, like, Mm -hmm. you know, and so I think that's where, where it's headed. That's the only way, way I can see it. No, it makes a lot of sense. Doesn't it? It's, um, it, it just, the pattern, um, you know, the 70s pattern that you just described. Yeah. You know, it was it was sinusoidal, but it was up. You know, it was it was really three kind of peaks that went higher and higher. Um, 
<clears throat> with of interest rates and inflation uh, and you know then the there were cuts in between there and <laughs> they, basically the cuts didn't work and we wound up with you know double digit like grotesquely bad inflation and we we know like over history we know how this goes you know um it, it, do they save the currency or do they save the bond market and the banks well, they always save the bond market and the banks, and they always sacrifice the currency. So yeah. eventually, we kind of know where this is headed. Um, but that's long term. And in the meantime, the the dynamics are not easy to figure out at all. Like the dynamics with the dollar, I keep seeing people talking about the dollar being, you know, imploding and 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 even hyperinflation gets mentioned in the U.S. dollar every now and then. I'm like, uh, 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 nope. If the U.S. dollar goes that way, everything else will have gone that way, you know, well, well before it. Uh, and we're not there yet. So, yeah. I, yeah. That's a that's a totally different story. And what that well, yeah, totally, it's a yeah. totally different level of the story, I would say. Yes, it is. Yep, yeah. Different level of the story. It's the, in other words, I just don't want anyone to think we're saying, you know, this is a one way trip. It, you know, it's a done deal. They're going to cause inflation. The dollar's toast. It, life just ain't that simple, but right. markets yeah. do get a hint of what's coming. And, you know, the gold market certainly seems to have a hint. And, you know, I saw an article yesterday that pointed out that like retail investors are selling, you know, the, the, they're redeeming the, the big publicly traded gold trusts and they are, um, you know, they're certainly not buying gold stocks <laughs> and, uh, and the central banks, you know, are are doing the buying. So that's maybe what's pushing the price up here. It's an odd, it's an, it's, you know, history unfolds and it all turns out very oddly. Yeah. Who knows what will happen next? You better be prepared is all I have to say. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You look back on it and then it makes a lot more sense. But um, one other thing on the, the, the Volcker, Arthur Burns, uh, reference that was a really good issue you wrote by the way um oh thanks i saw one comment over the past week that jerome powell may have started off sounding like paul volcker and to your analogy wanting to be the coolest kid in uh high school but now right. he's sounding more like arthur burns or and looking oh, like yeah. it um yep. and i think that's that is a narrative an idea to consider uh if you haven't been considering it because you know i think I think the end of it and the the next part of this is just higher inflation than normal, um, which we've <laughs> we've had for already and we've seen what that story is like. And I'm seeing some of the same things happen again, like energy stocks are taken off again. Gold's taken, taken yeah. off. I mean, it's like I, mean, I feel like it's back in 2020 um, with some of the details different. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, right. just be on the lookout for that, for those things, I would say. And maybe just maybe, um, you know, speaking of gold and energy, um, maybe we also get a run out of, um, biotech stocks that we talked about, um, with Arez Kalia recently, right. um, yeah. because they're sort of just beaten all to hell as he, as he described. So who knows, who knows what kind of a run we get over the next, um, well, just call it through the end of 2025, since we're talking about Fed projections, you know, and if they're right, oh, well, you know, some of the stuff could scream, I guess. And, and sure, gold is already starting to, I'd love to see the gold stock start to, I think that's a great opportunity there. Um, it's It's been weird for the past couple of years to see gold up and gold stocks, some of them like way down, like past couple of years, Newmont's down like by more than half. You know, it's just um, it's it, it shows you how different those ideas are. Like you hold gold as a as an insurance policy, maybe as inflation hedge and you buy gold stocks really as a speculation on on the mining industry. It's a it's a highly capital intensive, highly competitive, um, you know, just crazy, highly cyclical industry. And they are different bets. I do. I just want to know that the listeners to know, I acknowledge the the difference in those two bets, but at some point those alligator jaws of that chart of gold stocks and gold, they have to close up, I think. And, 
And this could be it. This could be the catalyst, you know, more cuts or promises of more cuts even. So there, and, and, you know, just mentioning the biotech, there's things to do, right? There are things to do right now that you probably ought to do. <laughs> so, um, kind of an interesting moment. And, and as you point out, you know, bullish in the short term, right? So not a bad one to be in the markets right now, not a bad moment, you know? Um, and speaking of biotech, our, our guest today, um, is an expert on biotech among other technologies. He's probably one of the smartest, definitely one of the smartest people I know. Um, and one of the sort of, yeah, yeah. One of the most reliable experts I think that I've ever encountered, um, in biotech and some other technologies too. Like I had a lot of questions about the semiconductor industry recently, and he was the first guy I went to and he answered like almost all of them. So brilliant guy, um, has a great track record, lots of triple digit winners. And, uh, he wants to talk to us about, um, biotech and, uh, specifically these weight loss drugs and stuff today. And who knows whatever else is on his mind. I can't wait to find out. His name is Dave Lashman. He's our friend and colleague and editor of the uh, Venture Technology newsletter here at Stansberry. And uh, let's talk to him. Let's do it right now. The 2024 Stansberry Research Conference and Alliance meeting is back this fall in Las Vegas. And for the first time ever, they've extended their early bird discounted ticket pricing, which means if you reserve your seat today, you can save $450 off your ticket. Head over to www.vegasearlybird.com to find all the details and get your discounted ticket. The Stansbury Conference is truly one of the best business mixed with pleasure industry events out there. Past speakers have included Shark Tank's Kevin O'Leary, Dennis Miller, and Steve Forbes. And of course, all your favorite Stansberry editors will be there too, including yours truly. I mean, I hope I'm one of your favorites. <laughs> I look forward to this event every year. It's great getting the chance to meet our listeners from the show, whether it's chatting during a break or grabbing a beer at the end of the day or whatever. So I hope you're planning to join us. It's a great event. Go to www.vegasearlybird.com to get your discounted ticket before prices increase. That's www.vegasearlybird.com. So come on out and find me in Vegas and say hello. Dave, welcome back to the show. Always good to talk with you. We are, um, actually, I've become personally more interested in, uh, in a field you know all about just recently because we had um, Erez Kalir from Porter & Co. on, and he got me all interested in biotech because they're super dirt cheap by like Ben Graham standards. <laughs> so, you know, like biotech is something I never care about because I don't know anything about all the science behind it, at which I know is your bailiwick. Um, so I thought, well, <laughs> we've talked to her as, I think we should probably talk to Dave too uh, about this. And, um, are you like, he's, I don't know if you've heard him talk about this. He's super excited about biotech right now. Uh, how do you, are you in the same headspace as him? Are you super excited about, you know, one or more biotech stocks right now? For years, the, the idea of biotech as a sector has been appealing to, um, our analysts, but I don't ever look at it as a sector. I'm a uh, microeconomist, so I look bottom up, not top down, to find a drug that's so important that it will actually have a macroeconomic effect like the weight loss drugs, I look at the 6% problem. 6% of drugs that start phase one trial succeed. And it's a 94% burnout rate. So if you pick stocks, even if they have drugs in people, you have a 94% failure rate. And none of our subscribers can take that kind of hit. So you have to figure out some way to pick not only the drugs that will work, but the drugs that will work with limited competition in a mass market with large morbidity or mortality if it's not treated. And that's sort of the magic formula that I look for 
and my team looks for. And we go to conferences and we don't really have an agenda. We don't look at the company's financials at first because they're all tend to be developmental companies, but we'll pick huge companies. Nova Nordisk, Eli Lilly, these are $100 billion to $300 billion firms. I think Lilly might be $500 billion right now. But they still have one drug that's so big and so powerful, it will move their share price. And so that's what I'm hunting. I think Arez is cleverly using Moneyball so that he's looking for forgotten assets. Mm -hmm. And he's looking at it top down and financial and he's an MBA, so he can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's clever and I don't think that it, I mean, so far it's been working, right. which is great. I mean, yeah. more power to him. I like when people analyze drug companies and do it on an individual basis. I think that the macro play about we're buying biotech now at all of it forgets that you must have 94% losers. Dude. Like historically 94% of the drugs that uh, are in play are not going to make. Wow. So this reminds me that 6%, 94% reminds me of um, somebody I know is very good at picking exploration mining stocks because many of those um, will go to zero. And I'm sure that at, that firm once told me that they, they had, a, I know they had a year where they crushed it and all the money came from five or 6% of the stocks, you know, because they went a hundred, 200, a thousand to one kind of crazy numbers like that. But it seems like, you know, counting on that is probably not a great idea. <laughs> so, so that, that particular play, like you say, the sector play um, is riskier than kind of knowing what you're doing. Uh, about the science, it sounds like you're telling me. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah, um, I don't can't I can't be the six percent problem set either. I just wait till drugs are more advanced before I'll jump in. So there's three phases. The first one basically establishes whether or not, despite all your mouse trials and all your test tube trials, if it turns out to be poisonous in people, then it's not going to fly. So you take four people who are essentially end of life who are willing to be experimental guinea pigs and you give them a trace amount. It probably won't be effective. It also probably won't kill them, but at least you get an indicator. And then they step up doses in the course of phase one to sort of figure out, okay, are we getting anything like the effects that we saw in animal models? That's all phase one does for you. So it's not until phase two that you get into dozens of people with the disease that you get data about that compound and you get early efficacy data and you get early safety data. And for us, that's enough because if no other drug treats a condition, we don't really care if it is a 45% improvement or a 46.3% improvement or a 48.9% improvement. We don't have to see a thousand patients because we've seen dozens of patients and they're all getting better and that's good enough, right? So we can strike earlier than certainly Wall Street, certainly most investors, because we can fire after phase two. So we have all the phase one data, all the phase two data. And usually by the time we find a company, we're getting some indication from the FDA or the European counterpart, the EMA, that the results are good enough to move on to phase three. And then we have about a three-year wait where the company has no profits. If it's a small company, it has no profits. If it's a big company, the drug still hasn't struck and it's not yet for sale. So there's a long period of purgatory, moratoria, whatever you want, before what you know will happen will happen. And because every investment is an investment in the future, we think we have a pretty under good understanding about what will happen in the future. And we're routinely right, and we're sometimes wrong. Right. To that point uh, about the the time involved in the trials, I mean, I'm thinking back to so I joined Stansberry Research in like 2019. And then one of the first times I saw you in person, you were talking about the weight loss drugs. And that was right before COVID started. And at that point, um, I guess they were in trials. And obviously, the pandemic kind of overshadowed them now. But now, 
like there was, I'm looking, thinking back on it. There's so much time between then and now where those companies are becoming more known in the mainstream. I mean, Oprah just had a weight loss special. It had people from Novo and, and Eli Lilly on it, but you were on this like way before, right? Like, like, can you just, just tell me when, or tell us when, like you first started getting interested in the weight loss drugs and what you saw from them? So, I mean, I've been interested in a while and I've actually picked other weight loss drugs that didn't quite, they ended up treating genetic obesity, but not general obesity. So really, really rare genetic conditions. So they become like an orphan drug that very, very few people need them, but they're very, very sick. And there's a, a niche of biotech that treats rare genetic conditions. So I thought that that would go mainstream, but it didn't. So I've clearly been in the space since about 2018. But the funniest, weirdest moment was I was at a cardiology conference, the American Heart Association in like 2016. So, you know, nine years ago. And somebody was talking about their heart patients, a doctor on the stage, 5,000 heart doctors in the room, and he said, look, this drug is the best we can do unless we can get patients to lose weight. And the crowd broke into laughs and titters. Like that wasn't supposed to be a laugh line. But 5,000 <laughs> cardiologists knew that there's no way that they can get their heart patients to lose weight. I mean, that's the background I had going in. And that's why I've been looking basically at general obesity drugs since 2018. In 2019, I was in Paris for the European Society of Cardiology meetings. I was meeting a friend for lunch and I had to pass 900 doctors in line to get into a small room. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what is in that room, but I know that 900 doctors are in line to go see it. That's when I learned the wisdom of the crowd of doctors in Europe. And US has some weird free market medicine where doctors will overperform a procedure if it helps them buy a boat. Um, in the, in Europe, they don't do that. They're on flat salary, right? So there's no economic reason that those people were in line. They were just in line because they thought it was going to be a great drug. And that's when I came back from Paris and I said, Ozempic's going to be a weight loss drug and there's not going to be any limit to how much we can sell. 2019, I saw like mass crowds of doctors in Europe at EFC and I'm like, Look, they're voting with their feet. This is exactly the cardiology problem that in 2016 could not be met. How do we get patients to lose weight? And it's like an answer to that is pretty valuable. So we wrote it up for Porter Stansbury's investment advisory in 2019 by like November. And so this is like six months later. The conference was in June. And we had an argument internally about what this thing would be worth. And I'm like 5 billion, 10 billion or more. And our other analyst is like, well, Wall Street's saying it could be worth no more than 3 billion. So do you guys want to guess what it's worth? The two drugs from Lilly and Novo are worth in 2023? 100 billion? 28 billion bucks. 28. But it's, uh, I went a little it's too far. 130% year over year. And still, and still plenty of room for growth, right? You just wrote a digest about this, like the amount of capital investment these companies are making just to keep up with demand, right? Just the way that the, these drugs are produced. A lot of people don't understand. It uh, takes time. Yeah. Literally have to grow them, right? Yeah. I mean, if people listen to the presentation, they get a free report where I explain all this, mm -hmm. but I really like Dan's idea about trophy assets. And I try to use it when I can, but these are weird. They're unbuilt trophy assets. So Lily committed to $10 billion in spend to build more factories to make this drug. And the way that we styled it in the digest, because one of us might've been Marlin fishing with Porter. I don't want to mention any names. Um, and you guys ended up titling it like this part of biotech has never seen this investment. No part of biotech has ever seen this investment. $10 billion of factory <clears throat> only ever competes with the new factory making B21s for Northrop. And 
like Intel's newest chip fabs are like $8 billion factories. Like you can put a lot of them. And so you could have 16 if you build like two or three or four factories, right? But a brand new top of the line chip factory is about 4 billion bucks. Lily's spending 10. No one's ever spent this kind of money in biotech before. Novo Nordisk is spending six. And then they bought a company for another 11 billion. So between the two of them, they've put in 27 billion bucks in the next three years to make factory. That's just crazy. So what we did in the digest is compare it to Budweiser. Budweiser spends about four and a half billion on CapEx. If you average it over three years, it's closer to five. And that's what these companies are spending. And, and Budweiser makes, what was the number? 18 billion gallons yeah. Yeah, 18 80 million gallons. olympic size swimming pools a day of beer <laughs> right so that's how much capacity they're building in vats that basically work the same because they also have to keep yeast alive exactly like brewer's yeast in fact they use genetically modified brewer's yeast yeah it's fascinating. And they're, the, they're on the scale of the largest beer company in the multiverse right. to make this drug and so it's not quite a trophy asset but what's intriguing about it is this will relate to future sales, right? I tried to use build it and they will come, but that's a movie reference to field of dreams. So they go, you can't possibly, you know, choose a beloved movie title as, as your, as your go-to line, but it's true, right? That we know the demand is there. So what you have to do is make more supply. What's stopping these weight loss drugs from continuing to build at 140% Kager is supply, not demand. Wow. That's huge. So maybe my 100 billion wasn't so ridiculous. I'm just a little early with it. Oh, no, um, no. I mean, on current track, it'll hit 75 billion in 2024. Yeah. But they kind of have to get more factory up and running and qualified. I think that 2024 will be close to 50 billion in revenue. And 2025 they'll be at 75 and 2026 they'll be at 100 billion i have to tell you i i when when the conversation turns to these weight loss drugs my mind always goes to the same place and i can't help it i can't stop it and that is that I, it just kind of bothers me that look i understand if people have a genetic condition or or something else um but I don't know. There's something about sub using a drug to do something that you should have kind of done yourself. You know, you should, you should exercise and you should eat right. And you should do these things. Um, and I, I just feel like too many people are going to say, well, I can't do those things. So I'm just going to take this drug. It, uh, it, it, it bothers me a little bit philosophically. I just, I don't know. Um, I have to say it bothers me, but you know, if that's the way it's going, if that's where the demand is, I mean, who who am I? You know, I should just own Novo Nordisk uh, and Lily, and and not feel so bad, and you know, let my philosophical uh, worries for another day. I think what's weird is that it's bad insidious. So, in 1980, when you and I were, you know, somewhere in high school, uh, about <laughs> six tenths of one percent of the population was morbidly obese. And so it could be, you know, the butt of jokes. And about 6% of Americans were medically obese. Now the morbid obesity number is 6%. And the obesity number is about 40%. And that's self-reported. Self-reporting a million people that the CDC calls every year. The self-reported weight we know is underweight. People lop off a few pounds when they do it. So the problem is 10 times worse in the same population. Maybe since 1980, we've had a 50% population rollover. Half the people have died. And there's new people, right? But largely it's the same American cohort and it's 10 times worse. So it's not genetic. It's, it's the simple equation of calories in and calories out. So, and I'm actually going to blame uh, seat heaters. Who? 
seat heaters. Like my car has a seat heater, and it, ooh, it's so nice. <laughs> All but our down comforts. The of your yeah, back yeah, yeah. Is is an area of special kind of fat called brown fat mm-hmm. that burns to keep you warm. But if the environment is always heavily heated, you never need that. And you don't increase your metabolism to stay warm. So one of the things we've come across in the few days, really, working with Corey on the digest, is to call what these drugs do, these weight loss drugs do, the winter switch. So there was a side effect we've been tracking pretty carefully where both on the experimental side to try and get the pills instead of injectables, as well as the injectables, that your resting heart rate's going up five beats per minute when you're on these drugs. Well, that's to stay warm. Like effectively, they're they're boosting your basal metabolism, which does burn more weight. And then there's another side effect called loss of appetite. So if you're on a chemo drug or any kind of drug you want, and the patients lose appetite, that's a problem. But here, it's a feature, not a flaw. So if you combine loss of appetite and higher resting heart rate, what you get is the winter switch. What's being triggered is how at least the Northern Hemisphere and temperate Southern Hemisphere people have adapted to winter, which is there's not that much food and you have to stay warm. And what these drugs are doing is flipping a switch in your brain to put you into winter mode which makes you want to eat less and stay warm. And we can see it in study after study after study in the boost to resting heart rate. So this week, the FDA finally got around to approving something I saw in November, which is the heart benefits of these drugs. And it reduces stroke and heart attack by 20% in heart patients who are obese but don't have diabetes. So they got a new label like on Friday, at least... Uh, we govy did from Nova Nordisk to to be heart protective. So even though it's boosting your resting heart rate, it's actually vastly better for heart patients to lose weight, which is what I saw eight years ago. Wow. We got to get these never... patients weight, and it's the same people. But because we have electric bikes and seat heaters, and I sat next Drive to a car. Drive yeah. through and chicken chalupas from Taco Bell. <laughs> yes. Which are my favorite. Calories in are a factor, but we've also made sure that we don't have calories out by heating our rooms higher and higher over time. Right? Wow. Uh, we, we don't have to heat up to stay warm because we'll just boost the thermostat. And also, like, I was in the Amsterdam area at a medical conference in 2023 next to a Dutch doctor who was freaked out about electric bikes because all his patients used to bike everywhere, but now they're electric biking everywhere. So they're just not getting the same caloric burn, even though they're moving by bike. So in the U.S., we just get into Dan's F-150 and we'll just drive <laughs> But in, in Denmark, they used to uh, they used to bike everywhere, and now they electric bike everywhere. So they can go up any hill without any trouble, which means they're not putting their heart through the paces. And when Wally, the cartoon, showed a you know people getting larger and larger and larger in the opening montage, so that they had to sit in electric carts, like. Go to a hospital, notice that every bed is reinforced twice as wide. MRIs have had to have a bigger circumference. The cylinder that you have to put someone in is is larger to get people in because those are the people that are going to have health problems. Wheelchairs are a chair and a half. Like we're we're like basically on the Wally mode. You know, and, that's weird. Oh. Yeah, like culturally, like we've you know, a lot of different people you know, have created this problem and now we're trying to come up with the solution <laughs> all in one generation it seems like just from the food that people eat i mean we clearly i'm talking americans europeans like clearly eat too much which is what i've realized i've started paying attention to uh calories more recently as i am now approaching uh slightly more advanced age and 
it's like noticeable. You just you, like I've just noticed you just eat too much. Um, and now uh, again, like of course, there's some people where it's a lot more severe and um, you know genetic and obesity and uh, as a disease. But um, yeah, it's it is pretty crazy just how quickly, relatively speaking, in the history of of uh, humanity, like we got to this point and then these drugs developing. Um, just how quick, how huge the market is. Yeah. I mean, Wally kind of meant it as a joke, right? But it's yeah, really, yeah. it's really not a joke. <laughs> no, no and not, I have a different option than you guys. What I'm following is the insane profile. So me and two of our colleagues are uh, doing a triathlon, uh, half Olympic. Well, more than Olympic, but the half Ironman. So I have to swim so that I don't let down my team of friends. So I have to swim a lot. <laughs> so I'm increasing my output yeah. and then eating what I want. Yeah. I've heard other people tell me that too. They say, I just, I just exercise more and I eat anything I want. Um, it's, you know, whatever works, but I, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm a bit shocked. I've never heard this thing about the winter switch before. Um, but let me ask you something else, Dave. Um, when I talk to people about this weight loss drug thing, they just they start talking. Um, like we we spoke with um, a fellow named David Cervantes, and I talked to him at our our conference, our Stansberry conference about this, and he thinks right, right. it's it's a massive. It, it is going to be a massive uh, change in the global economy. Like you know, it, it, pe people are going to take these drugs and. Airplanes are going to use less fuel and, um, you know, food companies are going to sell less whatever garbage or, you know, chips and dips and stuff. Um, do you do any of that research or do you just stick to the science? So accidentally, I can agree with him. The accident was I went to the Big Island of Hawaii with my family three days before the half Ironman in Kona. Mm -hmm. And everyone on the plane was tan and really thin it was like a 1950s aircraft yeah and we went so freaking fast that we were there sooner like okay. everyone on the plane weighed like a buck as women and a buck 50 as men and the pilot's like uh we're gonna be landing 45 minutes early across the pacific <laughs> so yeah. they save like 45 minutes of fuel because yeah. Everybody had an eight pound bike and no other gear, but swim shorts yeah. and they all weighed a buck 50. Like wow. it's crazy. I'm sure that that would play out. I'm sure if we generally lose weight, that planes will get lighter, but that's a supply driven constraint. We know the demands there. Mm -hmm. So you have to have enough supply before you're going to see it in airline fuel. You have to get enough patients on these drugs to have a population level of fact. Right. And that's going to take a few years, two or three years, it sounds like. I mean, even in World War II, uh, Hershey bars were a thing. And I don't think that Hershey's necessarily in trouble. Like, so you want to eat less. You can still choose what you eat. If you have a smaller portion size and a small chocolate bar afterwards, you know, we might not see anything in Hershey sales. It's hard to look 10 years ahead and see some marginal change in some other business where we know that the focal point is going to be Lillian Novo. Sure, sure. The, 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 my, my only qualification there is like those second order effects can be huge and you know, just completely nonlinear and unexpected. And if you could learn to expect them, um, you know, there could be an opportunity somewhere. But, but I hear you. It's, it's very, very hard to. It's because of the supply constraint, right? Like one of our colleagues, Ken, talk about, talked about trying to trace down these subscriptions, prescriptions for Lily's drug, and he had to go to 10 pharmacies to find it. And the constraints, as more and more people get on the drug, the constraints, the demand constraints are, are loosening because the approvals are for more and more conditions, general obesity, for two different drugs and a heart condition, which 
right now isn't even covered by most insurances because it's only been approved like Thursday. So as more and more people can get drugs for free, there's going to be more demand. I see. And it makes me wonder about, you mentioned heart condition, it makes me wonder about that guy who got a laugh talking about, um, you know, in 2016 at the conference you mentioned, um, talking about, well, you know, this is the best we can do now um, because our patients need to lose weight to do any better. Uh, I wonder if that impacts, you know, big, important, you know, sales of big, important heart drugs eventually. I mean, the market's already responding to that. The market doesn't know how to measure what other conditions will be affected by the power of the weight loss drugs because everyone's looking at it based on the trial results. The final phase of trials is phase three. Those are also called pivotal trials because those lead to approval. The pivotal trials are really impressive. One of the studies I saw only looks at excess weight. So they say you have a BMI of 25 goal. If you have a 50, if we get down to 25, that's the goal, right? And so that's actually only 50% weight loss to bring you from 300 pounds to 150 pounds or whatever, right? So it, it doesn't look that impressive like, oh, they lost 30% of their weight. Well, that's not 100%. It's like, anybody want to lose 100% of their weight? No. <laughs> You're gone. That's skeleton weight, right? Yeah. What you have to do is go back to essentially your high school weight, depending on how you went through high school. But right. what we can see in the long-term trends is people gained weight over time, a little by a little by a little. So we want to pull people back to, to those earlier conditions. And, and then keep them there. Yeah. Well, that's a different problem set, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which there's I, a different problem set. Yeah. I but no, but I still, if you look that. at the phase three data, you see these 20, you know, 15 to 25% rate loss. We know medically that 5% means something. 10% means a lot more. 15% is so unprecedented. We're trying to figure out what it is. If you get stomach banding surgery and you lose 15% of your weight, it literally cures type 2 diabetes. You no longer have type 2 diabetes. Cures mm -hmm. it. So now we have drugs that do 20 or 25% weight loss in obese patients, not young healthies but in obese patients. And it's pretty remarkable what the changes are, but it's still supply constrained, which is why there's such a big building spree. But it's not until the building spree is done that we'll begin to touch the level of demand. There's 100 million obese American adults, 100 million that need weekly injections. So that's only like, you know, 5.2 billion fully filled syringes a year. Oh, no problem. Just for the US market. Yeah. What kind of output is that, right? It's not software. You can't just do another download. You have to make 5.2 billion vials. Well, I, I, I don't know. I feel like we've covered this. I just feel like I have a lot of homework to do. And I really, I was thinking about, well, maybe I could get at this with a biotech ETF. But after talking to you and hearing all this, you know, research just into this one drug, I'm thinking, uh, uh, maybe I'll let Khalil handle this. He's he's a you know he's uh, probably going to study these things a lot more closely than I will. Well, in our report, right, we we give you the two Novo and Lily for free, and we tell you why I like them. And I just wrote this report like last week, so it's as fresh as you get. And I've been to all these conferences, so reasonably, I have a pretty good idea about what they're worth. I'm not saying I invented these drugs; I am saying I know what they're worth. But then we talk about, vaguely, five other companies that we think have equal promise in medicine. And we just don't give anything away. So like, if you want to find our best research, you buy it from us. Why? Because it's expensive to fly me to Paris. <laughs> <laughs> so there's probably, I mean, just the numbers you've described here, um, my guess is that like there's a massive opportunity here that maybe most folks don't really truly understand. I'm willing to bet the average investor who has listened to this interview up to this point is saying, oh, well, I didn't know that. And they're hearing you go, you know, 75, 100 billion by what was it, 2026 or something. I mean, they're going, whoa, I know, I'm, I know I was, I didn't know it was like that. So yeah, 
I, I feel like you've, uh, I don't know. You you've delivered today, Dave. <laughs> you really have. As you yeah, always me too. Do. We're, I think the people for are seeing maybe why or hearing why. Um, you know, Dave, what do you have? Like thirty different picks in uh, your publication that have doubled. I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Since the yeah, inception, which is and these, you know, you can talk. You know, the smaller companies that become <laughs> big, but the in in these areas that i mean from reading your your stuff like and people i assume are getting a sense here too like just the amount of detail and knowledge of these different areas and why specific like why why you're able to place bets in these places i think hopefully people are getting to so yeah thanks i mean i talked to dan on this show because we don't hang out weirdly we live like 300 miles apart so that's probably our excuse yeah. But <laughs> what I look for, even when I pick big companies, is a 10 to 1 reward to risk ratio. And not just for the drug to succeed, but for the technology to pull the company up by a 10 to 1 percentage. So if it's a huge company, but it has 100% upside, but it has 10% downside, that's the, that's the 10 to 1 that we're looking for. So anything I put in my portfolio, I hope to see a 10 to 1 reward to risk ratio. And and really that's that's the hidden that's what's driving my pick. So my portfolio is tested against the S&P 500. Why? It's ridiculous. I don't know. But because I have a global view and I don't really have a cap size size for market cap that I'll pick. Um, I'm willing to take on the S and P 500. And I noticed that Warren Buffett lost over the last five years to the S and P 500. And he's in the S and P 500. <laughs> Berkshire Hathaway's in it and he lost. Yeah. And his biggest holdings, Apple, which is also in the S and P 500 and Buffett still lost. And what's really funny is I beat him. I beat Buffett over the last five years. I just couldn't quite beat the S&P 500, but neither could he. <laughs> and it's like, oh no, we're only making 10.5% a year. It's like, that's a lot. Yeah. And we're really not getting that many blowups. We're getting some, but we're getting... Any one that doubles is on the path to making more. And the most you can lose is 100%. We tend to get out before 100% loss, but... We think we're doing okay. Yeah, I would say. But I want more. to tell you guys something before we finish. I'm looking at a new pill for weight loss, not an injection, that I'm going to talk about in my issue that drops a day after this recording drops. So we might actually resurrect the package around this pick. So these winter switches... There's 45 drugs approved or in development chasing the winter switch. There's two drugs in the world in development chasing the hunger switch. And they're both owned by the same company. The deal only happened to buy the pill version instead of the protein in January. The stock went up a little bit. It fell back down. So... It's a pill for weight loss with no competition that's valued at zero dollars. That's well, <laughs> that's my wow. next issue. Wow. We are at the end here. Um, and I usually ask my final question um, at this point, and you've answered it many times. Um, and it's the same question for every guest, no matter what the topic, even if it's a non-financial topic. And if you've already said the answer, by all means, feel free to repeat it. And the question is, if you could leave our listener with a single thought today, what would that be? I think that the popularity of weight loss drugs is in front of their availability. And as these factories get built, that's going to roll into revenue, which is going to roll into profits, which is going to roll into earnings per share, which is going to drive these stocks up over time. So one of my friends, a doctor I work with said, you know, I don't like Novo and Lilly because I don't like their P to E, their price to earnings ratio. And I'm just like, wait, <laughs> just yeah. wait. Yeah. When earnings go up, 
earnings are going to go up. Right. They're going to earn so, their way into it. Yep. Right. They're going to they're going to earn their way. They're both ridiculous growth companies and they're going to keep growing. The idea that you'd look at it in a static sense and say, well, if Oprah knows about it, there's no one else who can be served. It's like, that's not true because you have to make 5.2 billion vials and you have to have the capability to take a brand new drug and make 5.2 billion pristine vials. That's ridiculous. All right. All right, Dave. It's always a pleasure to... Um... To just Hi. plumb the depths of that big brain of yours. And uh, thanks for being here. Really a pleasure to talk it's, to you. Do you again. see this like sunlight in Seattle that's like breaking out in the I background? <laughs> it was crazy overcast when no, we started. I... And I'm not really this bright. It's just the sun sighting. A rare sun sighting. Wow. <laughs> I know, right? What's that big yellow ball in the sky? <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks again. Thanks man. very much, guys. The Fed wants you to believe they've got inflation under control, but I believe we've only seen the beginning of a devastating new crisis. And if you don't prepare now, you could see your savings evaporate as inflation and interest rates soar even higher over the next two years. It all traces back to a golden thread that ties together the biggest financial calamities in America's history. But it seems the entire financial world is falling into this very same denial trap that led to massive devastation the last time this crisis played out. If you know your history, you know there will be winners and losers, and now is when you decide which one you'll be. I've spelled it all out in an urgent new report. Go to www.bankrun2024.com to get your free copy. I'll also show you how to get my complete playbook for navigating this crisis including the three critical steps to take immediately. Again, that's www.bankrun2024.com for your free copy of my new report. It's like clockwork, man. Have Dave Lashman on, learn a bunch of cool scientific stuff that indicates some huge opportunity, right? Every single time. It's great. Every single time. He does not disappoint. He always learns yeah. something. And this yeah. is uh, obviously a huge topic right now. Uh, weight loss drugs and biotech generally. So yeah, Dave Lashman is to biotech what Rick Rule is to exploration mining. They just <laughs> they they know everybody in the space. They go to all the events. You know, they know all the technology and all the ins and outs of the business and and they find enormous freaking winners. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. It's and it's yeah, fun. I mentioned, it's his, fun to know I mentioned his double. I mentioned the ones that he's that have doubled that he's recommended. One of those was NVIDIA way back uh, in like 2016, I want to say. So he's yeah. not just like in, you know, biotech. I mean, that's tech and it, the chips will be used in bio, in bio as well. But um, yeah, a lot of like just breakthrough technologies, industries. Um, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, definitely, uh, can find, can find the areas and sci and have like the science to back it up and like why this is going or wh why yeah. the potential is there at the very least. And I've heard, um, you know, obviously the weight loss drugs are a huge topic, right? They're, they're all the whole world's talking about it. Never heard of the winter switch before. I've never heard of that before. It yeah. just, yeah, no, you know, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. Yep. Really cool, man. Knowing Dave Lashman, I remember one time early on, um, in the business and I think it was just like Porter and me and Lashman and Steve Sugarroot, And that was it, you know, it yeah. was just us four. And, and, uh, Porter said, he said, like we we both Dave and I had a similar style of presentation. We just bombarded you with everything we knew. We just like bombarded you with with you know facts and information. You know, less storytelling, lots of information, and it was probably hard to sit through. And Porter got up one time after one of us had spoken, and he said, "These guys are dangerous. They're like spies. They're dangerous because they know too much." You know, <laughs> so. Um, it's really, it's really good to, to have watched Dave over all these years, just like, you know, learning one complicated thing after another and, you know, being able to sort of tell these cool stories about it um, and finding, you know, like 30 
triple digit gainers and you mentioned nvidia nvidia was like a 13 14 bag or something like that i mean it was like incredible so yeah yeah yeah, yeah <clears throat> it right. is incredible yeah lots of good fun man love love dave lashman love having him on the show um so that's another interview and that's another episode of the stansbury investor hour i hope you enjoyed it as much as we truly absolutely did Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.